Having now established some of the background biology of symbiosis in part 3a, let's turn our attention to the bluebells and the symbiosis that we know supports them, as well as most other plant species, at every temporal and ecological level. Mycorrhiza. In its various forms, it's all over this picture and in any other landscape, a fundamental part of the scene, but we can't see it, below ground, in soil and roots, and microscopic. The plant fungus symbiosis mycorrhiza, in its different forms, has been on Earth for 400 million years, is the normal lifestyle of most plant species, and occurs on all continents. It is, therefore, absolutely fundamental in our understanding of the lives of plants and their special fungi, and in consequence the complexities of terrestrial ecology. When engaged in landscape destruction or its restoration, we really need to bear this in mind, wouldn't you think? In part 3a, we discuss the emergence of complexity with reference to this picture. Next, we will consider the four main types of mycorrhizas underlying this scene and their place in the landscape. First, just the big oak, which is ectomycorrhizal, as would be several other tree species if they were in the picture. The ectomycorrhizal system is the only one of the four that we can detect by above-ground manifestations, mushrooms. The fungus root association is invisible below ground, but can be seen after some careful digging, centre. The proximity of certain mushrooms sometimes shows as here which partnerships have formed. Scenes like these, admittedly cherry-picked, provide us with some perception of the relationship between the above and below ground realms, and with the application of a microscope, experiments and imagination to piece together the fragments of knowledge that we do have, we can begin to understand the entire system. Next, the meadow consisting of numerous species, many of them are buscular mycorrhizal. That includes the bluebells. Orchids present will have their own special mycorrhiza, while some species will have developed strategies for doing away with mycorrhizality altogether. Those exceptions are fascinating and I'll discuss them in another video. A good number of trees in the region are also are buscular mycorrhizal, and in this picture that includes hawthorn. Gorse, which paints the hillsides bright yellow in spring, is also our vascular mycorrhizal. The open hillsides, where soils consist mainly of peat, are very different. Phosphorus is not the main limiting nutrient, whereas nitrogen is, so many plants growing there require ericoid mycorrhizal fungi, which can mineralise the organic peat releasing inorganic nitrogen compounds that the heathers, bilberry and other ericaceous plants require. Also, there will be orchids with their special needs and herbaceous plants and grasses that associate with our buscular mycorrhizal fungi with varying commitment. With sufficient understanding, we can read a landscape. Given knowledge of the underlying geology and the soils created, and assessing plant communities even from an informed glance at a distance, we can determine which mycorrhizal communities might be present and then why there are different habitats. An exercise I conducted in real life when objecting to the landowner's desire to plant trees all over this mostly treeless landscape. Trees don't grow where trees can't grow if, among other controlling conditions, the required mycorrhizal fungi are, predictably, likely to be unavailable. Now we'll turn our attention to the bluebell and its mycorrhiza. Normally we see only what is above ground, while unseen there's a lot going on below. So that's where we must look. But I'm afraid it's not going to be easy. A single bluebell plant has a bulb composed of compact white flesh and has at its base a dome-shaped disc of a stem upon which roots, two colourless leaf sheaths, green leaves and scapes, that's the flower stalks, are all born. This old illustration of a single naked bluebell is remarkably accurate, except the root system, which is, after all, fundamental to this study, is shown unnaturally with all the roots short and dangling. In real life, the roots can be much longer and spread, many of them horizontally, with some diving straight down and others reaching up into the nutritious upper soil. In order for the French artist to paint this completely exposed plant, it would have been necessary to dig it up and wash away any soil adhering to the remains of the roots, 
which being brittle will have broken into hundreds of fragments left behind in the field. The roots remaining still attached to the bulb, being wet, will have tended to droop, adhering in a bunch. The artist has rearranged them neatly and tried to reconstruct the root system, but was unable to represent the root's true spread and orientations. The artist has also shortened the below-ground stem. Mature bulbs are positioned deep in the soil in the mineral horizon where phosphate is in poor supply, hence the utility of mycorrhiza. Thomas Woodhead, in his day a renowned Huddersfield botanist, is one of the few people to have investigated the biology of bluebell. His drawing of a soil section shows the mature bulbs well below other woodland plants, bracken and soft brome. Bluebell roots inhabit a soil horizon in which phosphate is very scarce. Compared with, say, a grass, its roots are few, short and unbranched, not made for reaching out through the soil to gather a rare nutrient. From the earliest days of life on land, plants have always engaged with fungi, forming symbioses which overcome this nutritional limitation, mycorrhiza. A wide-ranging fungus can better forage for phosphate than its plant partner, which in its turn will assist the fungus with the product of its photosynthesis, carbohydrate. Many modern plants are completely reliant upon this cooperation, which has been field-tested over several hundred million years. Most bluebell roots for most of the year are packed with mycorrhizal fungi of the order Glomeromycota, here represented by photomicrographs of a Glomus and a Scutellospora species. At our Yorkshire field site, it was Scutellospora that dominated the mycorrhiza from root emergence in mid-August until leaf flushing in late winter. Experiments showed that it was pumping soil phosphate into the plants via their roots at a time of maximum growth. From New Year, other species began to take over, their individual functions difficult to determine. Here is a section of root well colonised by a mycorrhizal fungus. What might we see if we were to slice it in two and then swivel it through 90 degrees to look at the cut end? I don't have a picture of that, but rather conveniently there are pictures of 400 million year old plant fossils showing a similar mycorrhiza and telling an important story. Here we're dealing with the most ancient of several mycorrhizal symbioses, our buscular mycorrhiza, which we know from fossil evidence and DNA studies, co-evolved with land plants some 400 million years ago. Here's a cross-section of a plant fossil from the Devonian period, proving that mycorrhiza evolved along with the very earliest of the land plants. The white ring shows where the fungus has occupied the rhizome tissue. The arrow is pointing to one of many ancient arbuscules, highly branched organelles in side root cells where nutrients are exchanged between the plant and its fungal partner. This is it. Compare the ancient arbuscule with its modern descendant here of the fungus glomus in a bluebell root. Is that not extraordinary? The fossils were first described by Kidston and Lang between 1917 and 1921 and a lot of further research has confirmed the presence of mycorrhizas, promoting the theory that green plants and fungi evolved the terrestrial lifestyle together. Imagine the excitement that ricocheted around the mycorrhiza labs of the world, I was there at the time, when a Canadian team led by Luc Simon reported that their DNA studies confirmed the ancient origin of mycorrhiza, the date being coincidental with that of the earliest known fossils 400 million years ago. Before going any further, I think it's important to recognise that being mycorrhizal, the bluebell is anything but unique. The majority of plants on the planet are involved in one or another of the several types of mycorrhiza, while the few that are non-mycorrhizal have evolved mechanisms that have enabled them to opt out. However, we're here to look at just the bluebells and their mycorrhizas. Why bluebells? We must look at the components of nature before we try to understand how it works as a whole, and bluebell is the plant about which I know the most, having spent 12 years studying its ecology, above ground and below ground at the University of York. Unlike the example trees with mushrooms that we saw, 
There is nothing to see of the symbiosis that sustains Britain's favourite wildflower. But if you don't look, you don't find. First, you must dissect the subject of your inquiry. The senses and the mind must combine all the facts and intricacies of the unseeable, piecing together as many of the parts of an ecosystem that modern science can find out, eventually constructing an understanding of the whole. With permission, of course, for a whole year, I dug up clumps of bluebells and took them back to the lab where I divided each plant into its constituent parts, roots, bulbs, leaves and flowering stalks. The parts were sampled and assayed for fresh weight, dry weight, phosphate content and soil phosphate, while a root sample was taken for staining to show up the fungi inside, under the microscope to be identified and assayed for colonisation intensity. That created a lot of data which showed changes in the allocation of biomass and phosphate inflow, which in turn correlated with the quality and intensity of mycorrhizal colonisation. Some desirable investigations are just impossible, such as the format of the fungus outside the plant roots, in the soil where the fungus exists, as a network of fine microscopic fibres too small to see. If you dig to have a look, the network is shattered, entirely losing its structure. You finish up with a handful of soil with nothing to see of these special fungi. Maybe one day someone will invent a method that overcomes this shortcoming. It would be very interesting. We can, however, sample bluebell roots which, after processing, we can visualise, categorise and quantify. The roots need to be rendered transparent and the internal fungus stained so that it can be examined with a high power microscope. The method can be hazardous. When nearing the end of a career in which I use stains of sometimes appalling toxicity, a German lab discovered a superior and completely safe alternative. Fierheilig et al. had discovered the usefulness of pelican ink, not known in the UK. During a formal teaching course, one of the participants was a fountain pen user, his pen loaded with Parker Quink. He provided the stain we needed and the result was spectacular, so immediately we converted to Quink as our routine mycorrhiza stain. Having been cleaned, cleared and stained, roots are laid out neatly on microscope slides. Here are some of the slides made from root samples gathered throughout a growing season, August until July, ready for microscopy. The intensity of blue, quink of course, shows just how packed these roots are with fungus, all the year round. Examination showed that various species colonised in sequence, providing various ecological services. Seen close too, we can see that September roots, only a couple of weeks since they emerged anew from the bulb, were already well colonised by what turned out to be the fungus Scutellospora diperperescens. However, it is very, very difficult to differentiate the 11 or more fungi that associate with bluebells, though not completely impossible with practice and the help of a DNA sequencing colleague. It's even more difficult to name them. They do make spores of a sort which are highly characteristic of each species, but those are always found apart from the fungus in soil samples, so almost impossible to relate to the fungi they belong to unless by chance a spore is clinging to a piece of root. If we can't apply names to the fungi, we can describe and quantify recognisable differences. In the autumn, roots will look like this, absolutely packed with fungus, probably one we can identify with confidence, that Scutellospora diperperescens. By way of contrast, though, here is an unusual bluebell root that has not been colonised. While here is a root fully colonised by a different species of mycorrhizal fungus. Can you tell? And here, yet another species of mycorrhizal fungus, from its structure, with those globose vesicles, recognisable as a species of glomus, but I couldn't say which one. This specimen has unusually retained some attached fragments of the external soil phase of the fungus and we can see where it has entered the root in two places. The globular structures are oil-filled vesicles, a nutrient storage system. External hyphae enter the root by two methods. Mostly they clamp onto the outer surface of the root, cementing themselves in place by a pad known as an appressorium. 
The invading hypha drills into the root, growing into the main part, the cortex, where it proliferates longitudinally between the cells along the root. Less frequently, the invading hypha clamps onto a single-celled root hair, drills into it and grows down into the root. When it reaches the cortex, it exits the cell interior and, as is happening in the more usual sort of entry on the left, proliferates along the root between the cells. Here we can see the internal hyphae travelling along the root with fuzzy items off to either side. These are the little organs that facilitate nutrient exchange between the fungus and its host bluebell, the arbuscules, literally little trees. Here is an arbuscule in close-up, less like a little tree than some. Here is where the fungus provides the bluebells with phosphate from August until New Year, when other fungi take over. This sort of arbuscule is a thick, twisted coil bearing tufts of fine elements. These arbuscules are quite different, much more tree-like, and belong to a different fungus, the glomus species we saw earlier, with its vesicles. Other than pushing through the cell wall, the fungus does not enter the cell properly, instead pushing into the membrane which lines the inner surface of the cell wall, the plasma membrane. Thus, every finest element of the arbuscule has intimate contact with the cell membrane, facilitating nutrient transfer into the bluebell, notably a phosphate, and this process has been going on for hundreds of millions of years, since the dawn of life on land. How do we go about conducting a field research project? Ideas first. We make observations and start asking questions. We share our thoughts, enabling an important ecological question to be posed, for which a practicable research strategy may be devised. My project, begun 1989, was to discover whether the properties of mycorrhiza already demonstrated under convenient artificial conditions in the greenhouse represented what actually happened in the wild. My research plant was Bluebell, a beautiful inhabitant of beautiful woodland, while my colleagues who set out to research a similar question, for which, importantly, they got different but equally significant answers, were given a small, winter-flowering grass which grows in cold, wet, windy places in East Anglia. We measure and record every parameter we can think of, creating a vast spread of ecological data that may or may not be used later. The important thing is not to miss information we might eventually need. In my work, I first took samples for detailed analysis, in the first exercise carefully lifting the bluebells aside, removing some roots and replacing the plants. I also sampled soil from around the roots for the extraction of spores. Both samplings provided plenty of data, but unfortunately in practice the two did not correlate. Other results provided a lot more valuable information. At the same time, individual field-collected bluebells were divided into four parts to ascertain phosphate, P, inflows, and allocation of P and carbohydrate, C, to the various bluebell tissues, plus root colonisation by mycorrhizal fungi throughout the seasons of a single year to demonstrate, or not, an ecological function of mycorrhiza under field conditions. That experiment provided the first evidence of mycorrhizal behaviour in an undisturbed natural ecosystem by demonstrating the temporal coincidence of root colonisation by mycorrhizal fungi and the inflow of phosphorus in adult bluebells. There are numerous ways to find out how the bluebell mycorrhiza works. Here, a field experiment in which a fungicide was used to see how bluebells in the field get along without mycorrhiza. The answer? rather badly, confirming the conclusion already reached from the physiological study that bluebells and their fungi are dependent upon each other. Question. How do plants, including bluebells, fare when inoculated with different mycorrhizal fungi? Answer. Some extremely well, others, in particular the bluebells, very poorly. The bluebell mycorrhiza works at its best in woodland, left alone undisturbed to complete its life cycle in the same place every year while spreading unhurriedly. My research at York generated a small cascade of peer-reviewed publications for other scientists to read. Also in the magazine British Wildlife, 
presented to a wide audience of naturalists the scientific papers would be unlikely to reach and then to a very different but interested audience in Resurgence magazine, self-described as at the heart of earth, art and spirit, followed by a translated version in an Italian magazine with a similar non-scientific audience. Locally in northwest Scotland, Bluebell Mycorrhiza found its way into the Sky and Loch Alsh Environment Forum's website and in 2023 this YouTube channel. We must keep thinking about what we know about bluebells and other biological unknowns and what we don't know, alongside many other ecological puzzles, extending our thoughts from the individual through the local to the global scale. Our researchers warned that if humans severely disturb their favourite wildflower or its fungal partners, yes, lab experiments and field trials showed that bluebells do not like soil disturbance, both will decline until they disappear, leaving us wondering why it all happened. If we don't do it by habitat destruction, climate change will probably do it for us anyway. That's a conversation we really must have. Of course, we know that. It's precisely what's happening. Biodiversity is declining worldwide. How could that be? Probably in many ways just human ignorance and greed, but unless we look deeply into the difficult science, we will never see it from nature's perspective. If we want to understand nature, and we really need to, this branch of the biological sciences, with others, is essential, indeed fundamental, but please don't expect it to be easy. Nature has had four and a half billion years in which to become complex, self-sustaining, and, for us, difficult to comprehend, particularly if we don't try to find out. If we seek to understand nature, we will realise that it's not our job to exploit or restore it, but to give it space to function as it used to before we came along. Nature can be remarkably resilient if allowed to carry on without our interference.